He just loves us. It's just wonderful to serve God. And so many times we feel just like this song says, to be able to raise our hands or just to be able to talk to somebody and tell them how good God is because He is so good to us. It's like I tell them different times at work because it's just good to give us some strength and, and to be able to get up out of bed because I've got a brother that's paralyzed. And, but I'm just so thankful that I'm able just to pop up out of that bed in the morning and get up and go about my business. He just blesses. Just to me, that some people are getting that simple, but He blesses in so many other ways. When you look at people in this walk of life, it's down on their luck and people that we come in contact with, God's blessed. He's really blessed us all. And we can just lift up the mighty name of Jesus and point one soul to Him and He can deliver and, and, and just start us on a brand new walk of life. It's just wonderful to know the Lord.
have a very, very uh, familiar scripture. We really don't hear it preached on a whole lot anymore, but uh, uh, turn with me to the book of Luke. Uh, you'll recognize it when we get in. And I'm not really wanting to preach to you here this morning, because probably the majority of you up here are Christians. But you know one of the easiest ways to witness to someone else is just walk up to them and say, Hey, the preacher said this this morning. And you just kind of walk right in the door there that the door's open for you. So uh, when you go uh, back in your camper or back home or on your job where you might uh, want to go, just any time you want to do it, just walk up to an unsafe person and say, Well, the preacher said this. Well, that's Sunday morning. And they'll just open the door for you. You get curious, you know what the preacher said. Or he'll run the other way, one or the other, or she will. <laughs> okay. I want to get into the message here this morning, and I'll read a few scriptures here, and then go back up. I, I do a lot of teaching and preaching. I think it's necessary. We can say all kinds of fancy words, and maybe jump up and down, and, and I can probably run around these poles here this morning, might be a Bible, it might break a neck. But if we don't have the Word of God in our preaching, it's just about as useless. Amen. It takes Amen. God first. Nothing else is going to work. You can't have a law game to make it work. You can't have a shower to make it work. You can't have a fellowship to make it work. And those things are all good and nothing wrong with them in their place. But it takes God's word to, to convert people, to save us, to get them on the right track to heaven. Very familiar trick for you this morning. Tie the rich man and lad. Anybody ever heard of it? And in the book of Luke, the only place that I know it's recorded. Chapter 16, verses 19 through uh, 31, looks like. 19 through 31. The book of Luke, chapter 16. I've wondered something about this scripture for quite a while. And uh, as I studied on there, I think the Lord gave me the answer. So there was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus who uh, was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died in his prayer. And in Hades or hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and see Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his foot. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water to cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest the good things, and likewise Lazarus the evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and there is a great gulf, fixed that so that they who would, who would pass from here to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from there. Then he said, I pray thee, therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. For I have five brothers that may testify, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come unto this place of torment. Abraham said to him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham. But if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said it to him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Though one rose from the dead. Let's pray. Father, we pray your blessings upon the messenger this morning, upon each one that has ears here this morning. Father, we pray that you would open them up. Lord, they might hear your word. Lord, we just want to praise you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the understanding you give us of your word. Praise you. 
God also about your wrath. Lead us and guide us now and help us forward to do your will. We trust in you and praise you. In Jesus' holy and precious and loving name, we give you praise. Amen. Amen. A lot of people may think that this is a parable. I disagree with that thought because there is a man's name mentioned in this story. Never in any other parable that I know of, you can search the scripture if you want to find out, never in any other parable that's, a, that's an earthly story with a heavenly means, what a parable is, is a man's name mentioned. And I wondered as I, as I thought about the scripture this morning, said a certain rich man. You remember one day a young man came to Jesus and he was very rich. And he said, asked Jesus, he said, what must I do to have eternal life? Keep the commandments. I've done that from my youth up. And believe on God. Believe about God. He's done that. He's done all those things. Oh, there's one more thing I want to tell you about Jesus. Sell all that you have and give to the poor and come and follow me. And the bottom dropped out of that man. He sunk from here as low as he could get. Why? Not because he had possessions. It's because possessions had him. Possessions was his God. And I wondered as I looked at these scriptures, is Jesus talking about the same man here? I don't know. That's just a thought that comes into my mind. That's something for you to wonder about, something for me to wonder about. I have no way of proving that in Scripture, but I wonder, is this a certain rich man that Jesus had in mind when he told the story? I believe this is a true story about a true happening about a certain rich man. There was definitely this particular man. We all know that they're rich men. Some are rich, some are poor. You're rich to some, you're poor to others. I don't care what kind of finances you got, you're rich to some, but you're poor to others. But a certain rich man says he was clothed in purple and fine linen. In other words, he had everything that he needed. Now what is it about purple? We can see purple about any day that we want to uh, open our eyes and look around the world. Purple was very precious back in those days. It was very hard to get. I understand it was some kind of a lamb or seashell or something like that. They had to open up and, and uh, or some type of little sea animal they had to open up and get just a little bit of this purple dye out of it. And that's the only way they had purple. So if you had a, a cloth or a, or a garment of any kind that was made out of purple, you would rich because it took a lot of those little animals or a lot of those little sea creatures uh, I don't remember exactly what it was, uh, lamb or whatever, but it took a lot of those to get enough purple to dye a garment with. So this man was very, very extremely rich to have a garment that was in purple, in the color of purple. And fine linen, everybody knows fine linen, you know, when you go buy clothes, it's made out of imitation material today, but it's fancy garment. So if you get fine linen, you're going to really pay for it. So this man was able to do that. And very selfishly every day he didn't have no worry. You know what we would say about this man today? You know what the conversation even among Christians would be today about this man? He's got it made. He's got it made. Really, he doesn't have it made. I want to prove that with this scripture here. He doesn't have it made, but that's what we would say about him. We would look at his finances, we'd look at his home, maybe look at his family, and look at all those things and say, this man has got made. But he didn't have it made. He was lacking in one thing. He was lacking in the same thing that the rich man was lacking in when he comes to Jesus. The rich young ruler when he comes to Jesus. He was lacking in one thing. He was lacking in that very thing. I'll show you what it is here in this minute. So there was a certain beggar just holding the odds. I was going to work one morning. I worked at 26th Street and Huntington in the Coke plant. I was going to work one morning or, or around noon when I go to work that particular day. And uh, I had to stop on 5th Avenue for a red line. There's one car ahead of me. That car pulled out. And all at once I seen a man rolling back the side of that car. And something fell off. I don't know if it was a mirror on the side of the car or what it was. But what had really happened, because the man did not 
see him coming, this guy had actually walked into the side of that car just as it had started out. But you could tell from his expression, and after he got up, knocked his hat off, and, and the mirror, whatever it was, was laying there in the street. But you could tell from his expression, he, he picked himself up off the black top there, and I thought he was seriously hurt, but he, he was able to get up. And he looked at that car like, what in the world is wrong with you? And then he staggered off and down between the buildings there where the street used to be. I got a feeling that that man was probably similar to this guy right here. No doubt he was a beggar. He lived from day to day on this plot little stuff. Maybe he could get out of a garbage can or, or a bum a quarter for this one or that one. And probably when he got the money, he would go buy, when he got enough money, he would go buy something to drink. And that was probably kind of the same situation. But this man here is a little bit different. He was a beggar. True. But I think as he begged, he begged for food. If he got money, he begged for food. That's what he was interested in, was another uh, bite to eat. He was a beggar. It was very common back in those days. It's real common even yet today. We have beggars. We'll see them uh, mainly gathered in the cities where uh, they can find a warm place to, to lay down, uh, maybe uh, over top of a drain pipe or the the storm sewer or the sewer going through and they'll get a little bit of heat out of it or they'll, they'll sleep underneath the building or something like that. But this individual here was a little bit different even though he was a beggar. I'll show that to you here in just a minute. His name was Lazarus. Now here's the key to this story. It's not a parable because it never has a name, a man's name been used in a parable. There's a man. And it says, who was laid at his gate? Talking about the rich man. The rich man had a gate. The poor man, the beggar here, had nothing. Didn't have anything. Somebody had to carry him and lay him there. He wasn't even able to do that. So he was down to nothing. And I wonder, uh, about all his begging in different places, he was begging, maybe he'd run out of uh, anyone to give him anything in those places. So. He asked somebody to carry me. I've got one more thought. I've got one more chance. Carry me and lay me in the gate of this rich man. I know he's got food inside. I can see him throwing it out in the garbage can. Boy, it just burns me up when we have to do that, even today. Throw food out into the garbage can. That food could be used uh, somewhere, somehow. Sometimes it's hard to get to those places. Uh, I used to work for uh, Alfie does over here, uh, uh, over here on Wilson Street at Ballard Sausage. They used to throw away hundreds of dollars worth of salt. Just go to the renter company and went there and they made soap or they made some stuff to go on their places. I don't know what all they do with that stuff. But anyway, uh, you never know what you put on your face, do you? <laughs> anyway, this man here was laid at the rich man's gate. Full of sores, the Bible says. He was in very good shape physically because when you're full of sores, it kind of hurts, do not it? I mean, he's ever had one little sore that was enough. This man was full of sores. He laid at a rich man's head. Desiring to be fed with the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. He didn't ask him for the steak. He didn't ask him for the mashed potatoes. He had, didn't ask him for the corn, uh, corn on the cob. He didn't ask him for all those things. We're getting ready to go to a, a reunion on my side of the family, and, and I'm sure there's going to be corn on the cob. Right? There's going to be corn cut off. There's going to be baked beans. There's going to be pinto beans, cornbread. Uh, am I making you hungry yet? <laughs> go with me. Come on, take it. Get to eat. But this man said, I just want what you're going to throw away. Now, what's the problem with giving somebody something you're going to throw away? It amazes me any more of these companies. Instead of giving someone something that they're going to trash, go in the dumpster. I heard about a guy today working for BFI, and he said, I just love going to Walmart. He said, occasionally they'll fill a dumpster. 
after up with lawnmowers and weight eaters and all kinds of stuff. So I'd love to go there then and pick up that trash. <laughs> That's one day he liked the job. Maybe not the rest of the day, but he liked the job that day. But he said, I just like to have the crumbs that falls from your table. He didn't worry about them being clean. You know, when you're hungry, just about anything tastes good, don't you? When you have a need, just about anything is good. Even though it fell on the floor and what we would sweep in the trash, this man would love to eat. That's how poor and how hungry this man was. And nobody would help him. With the exception of God's little creatures. It says the dogs. Come and make the story. Now you want to know what the dog's name is? King James Burton gives it to us. Moreover was the name. It says, Moreover the dog. <laughs> Not really, that's just, that's just the kind of little thing you want to do. <laughs> the dogs come and lick these stores. That's how unimportant this man was. Nobody else, he lost all hope. No one else would help him but the dog. God sent some dogs. You know, God will make a way some way, won't he? When man won't do it, he'll send an animal. When animals won't do it, he'll send some rocks. Somebody's going to praise him. Somebody's going to lift him up. This particular day, uh, he commanded some dogs. He said, I've got uh, uh, one of my children. Now, here's the difference between this beggar and the beggar I talked about earlier. The one that might want to beg some money from him to go get a bottle. By the way, if anybody ever does that, you know, that's what they're going to do it for. Don't give them no money. Okay? God don't require that. But you can go buy some food. And it would hurt them. You just sit there and watch them eat. Okay? But don't give them no money. Because when you do, you put them deeper and deeper and deeper. But when you get the money, they'll go back. Satan has got a lock on that money. This man wasn't like that. He didn't ask for nothing to drink. He only asked for the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. Now, something's getting ready to happen. Something that some of us may dread. I don't dread graduation day. I might dread what's in between here and graduation. What am I talking about? It says here, both men died. Now, we kind of sugarcoat it today. We might say that both men passed away. Or to the beggar here, we might tell somebody that he went on to be with the Lord. We have trouble with saying died. You ever notice that? You walk up to a loved one that's lost somebody, it's very hard to just bluntly say, your loved one is dead. You ever have any trouble doing that? It's hard. So we find some other ways of kind of easing in on the situation. But here it says, and it came to pass that the beggar died. Well, this man has really lost it up. He's been poor all his life. He's had to beg for a living. He's got sores. He's physically in bad shape. And now he's died. He was bad off, but now he's not. He was in torment, but now he's comfortable. He was in a bad place, but now he's in a good place. He did have a problem, but now he's got none. He went to a better place. And God says, I'm not going to let him take this journey alone. I'm going to send some angels down there. And they're going to carry him to this place. Remember what Christ told one of the thieves on the cross? The good thief. I'm going to call him the good thief. He said, today, you're going to be with me in paradise. What was he talking about? Because nobody, nobody has got to go to heaven at that time. 
not the heaven that exists where God is. But there was a holy place for the Old Testament saints until Christ could die on the cross and take his blood and place it on the mercy seat in heaven. There was a place designed and made by God as a holy place. Here it's called Abraham's bosom. Or paradise, as Christ calls it on the cross. Because that beggar, not that beggar, but that thief on the cross, when he died, Christ said, you're going to be today with me in paradise. That's where they went. Because they were all Old Testament saints. They could not, as Paul said, be absent from the body for us now to be present with the Lord. They couldn't be present with the Lord at that time. They had to go to this place as the holy place. And this scripture says that on the other side of it was another place. And this place was a place where the rich man is getting ready to die. It's going to have to go. Now, remember when Christ died on the cross, he was buried in a bar tomb, he rose again the third day, got back up. All these other gods can't do that. When they died, they got to stay there. But our God got up on the third day. He said he would be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Well, since he said that, I kind of believe that that's where, that's where this place was. But looking over a great gulf, we find a holy place for the unseen. They've got to be stored somewhere until the day of judgment. Judgment has not happened yet. It's future. And by the way, if you believe that I know all the plays will tell you this if you watch a play or if you see a, a movie about judgment. You'll see that the saved is going over this way and the unsaved is going this way. There's no such judgment with exception of one in Scripture. And that judgment, if you'll put it in context, it will plainly tell you that it's a judgment of nations. Not individuals, but a judgment of nations. I wish I had time. That's a whole message right there. I wish I had time to share that with you. Look it up. It's in Matthew, around the 25th chapter, somewhere in there. Go back to the first part of the chapter and read it. It says it's a judgment of nations. The uh, sheep was on the right hand. The goats was on the left. That's when Christ comes back to judge the nations. And I think it's to see where they're going to exist on the end for the thousand years. Now, the judgment of the saved and unsaved have to be a thousand years apart. We have totally lost it. I hope I have. I wish I had time to get into that, but we'll be here at 1 or 2 o'clock in the evening if I get into all those. But those judgments are a thousand years apart. So they have to be holy places for these people until this can happen. Now after Christ died on the cross and he rose, uh, many graves, I think the last part of Matthew tells us, many graves split open and the saints come out. Don't see how many. They said they come out and they walk on the streets. Okay, God either made a partial or a full clearing of this place where Abraham is. I sort of feel like it's a partial clearing. It may have been a full clearing. Because there's another scripture that says that hell has enlarged its bounds. So if you don't have no more saints down there to take up this place, then hell can go across that gulf and run on into this place. But at this particular time, talking about there was no crossing over, no way to go from here to there. Now, I want you to notice one other thing here. It says the rich man died. It don't 
don't say nothing about any angels coming to get him. He just died. And the next second that he had any consciousness, or he knew what was going on, he lifted up his eyes and he was in torment. Have you ever run into anybody that didn't believe in God? Let me see him two seconds after he died, and I guarantee you didn't believe in God. Two seconds. If it takes that long. He may not even take that long. I think this rich man here knew about God. Why do I think that? Because he recognized Abraham in this paradise place. He looked over and he seen Abraham and Lazarus being comforted in this place. But there was a great gulf fixed in between the two. And Abraham says, you can't come to here and we can't go to there. Separate. You know, once you're in hell, there's no coming out. <laughs> once you're in heaven, I don't believe it. You may be able to come out and roam on the new earth a little bit, but you're not going to leave heaven because the old earth, the old new earth is going to be heaven. Right there's going to be a holy city existing on that earth or suspended over on the other. And uh, we're going to dwell, but we're going to be able to come in and out. But this rich man lifted up his eyes, being in torment. Now, if you look over to the book of Revelations, about the 21st chapter, I believe it is, it talks about a great flat throne judgment. This rich man is going to have to come out of that holding place that I believe he's in even yet today. I don't know how long ago this particular situation happened. This story happened. I believe it's a true story exactly. As I spoke. I don't know how long ago, possibly 2,000 years ago, that it happened, but it's now almost 2,000 years since Christ had died on the cross. Uh, I believe that rich man is still there. Right now. Abraham! Send that old beggar that I ignore. Now, I want to show you something here that I wondered about the scripture for a long time. Because I believe in salvation by believing in what Christ done for me on the cross. That he died on the cross, he was buried, he rose again the third day. That is the gospel. When I believe in that and repent of my sins, I believe according to God's word, I'm saved. And I've done that. But I wondered, because I know for what good deeds that you've done, you're going to be rewarded for it. It has nothing to do with your salvation. Salvation is a gift. You can't do anything for it. I pray Jesus Christ on the cross, crucified, buried, rose again the third day, period. Period. Nothing else you can do. You can't add to it. You can't be good enough. You can't do enough, you can't preach enough, you can't teach enough, you can't sing enough, you can't set church enough, you can't do anything enough to warrant salvation other than believing on Jesus Christ. I believe that. I think Scripture really points that out. He says it's not a word that any man should vote. So why did this rich man go to heaven? Because he didn't help this beggar. No, that's not the reason. Because he really had not believed in God and accepted him from God. At that time, when this story actually happened, Christ had not come yet. He told about a story past. He told about an Old Testament people that was in the Old Testament time, dispensation time. So, what must you do in the Old Testament to be saved? Believe on God. That's what Abraham done. Abraham by faith was justified. Now why wasn't this man, which was a Jewish man, I believe him and they were both the Jewish. Jesus told a story about his brothers. Who else? Earthly brothers I'm talking about. Jewish people. 
Why do I think this, guy, this man knows about God? Because he called him Father Abraham. You know, a lot of Jews will believe because they have been born and Jews that are all right with God. And that's not true. They still got to have faith. It still takes faith to be saved. If you ever get saved, you'll have to believe that Jesus died on the cross for you and was very best in the third day. You'll have to believe that. you have to. This man, I always did say you preach your own funeral. And you let the, the world know what side you stand on through your everyday walk, your everyday conversation. If you've seen a beggar laying at your door and you're a Christian person, I believe you're going to try to help you. I believe your heart is that way. I believe Christ has come into you enough that he will at least give you a want to to help somebody. Now, somebody probably like me, give me no truck and I can work on it. Give me a person, I have no idea what to do. Don't ever get sick around me or don't ever have an accident around me. I just flat out don't know what to do. I don't know why. Stupid, I guess, but I don't know what to do. But anybody with any common sense at all, even myself, can know when somebody needs help. It was quite obvious, you know, when you see the dog thinking about somebody, trying to heal them, it's pretty obvious they're sick, aren't they? It's pretty obvious they're down and out. And I would imagine if you look at this individual, you can see the bones protruding almost through the flesh because of starvation. So the attitude for the crime was the table of the rich man. But the rich man, when he would come out of his gate, he'd go, walk off the other direction. I'll have old bonds here again this morning. Let me tell you a true story. I don't know every little detail of it, but I know nothing about it. And I can tell you this. There was a man who come assistant pastor in West Morgan. He walked out of church, but he became a sister pastor. He's one like me that believes in your actions is more powerful than your words in a lot of cases. He dressed up like a bum one Sunday morning and laid himself at the gate of the church. And here comes the church people along going to church that morning. Christian people going to worship in their fine clothes. Everything working good. Everything's going great. Love God, praise God, all those things. One of them, which was the deacon, went over and kicked him. And get out of here. He didn't know he was a pastor for the system. And another one told him to get on out here. Get on out, get out of the way. Uh, we're, we're having church this morning. You just get on out of the way. You're a nuisance to I mean, it, it's, it's kind of bad for us to have an old son sitting at the front door. And as the preacher preached the message this morning, that morning, he walked over to the deacon and said, You, I was the beggar that laid at the table at the door this morning. You can't be hurt. Last I heard of that church, they was having a board meeting or having an election. And I wonder if that man still sits the pastor in that church. I don't know. I wish I could tell you that, but I don't know. <clears throat> How would you like to have been in the deacon's shoes that morning when the pastor preaching his message walked up to you? One little boy in the church. When he got his last word in, somebody would have brought it in that. The deacon was the rich man. The little boy was the angel. Now, you know anything better? 
any better way to find out what really happened? There's no better way that I know of than talking to an eyewitness. If I would break my neck here this morning, which I might do, if I would break my neck here this morning, you would all be witnesses to that. You could tell someone else that had not seen me break my neck exactly what happened. Do you trust in an eyewitness? The court does. They were there, and usually they can give you, they may tell you a, a different way that they seen it. The man sitting over here, if he seen me break my neck, it's going to tell you a little bit different situation. He's seen me on my right side, which is your left. And this man over here could tell a different story because he's seen me on my left and his right. But they would all, they would both give you an accurate description on what happened. Roy fell on Sunday morning to the neck. They could tell the police that when they come. Yes, I've seen it. I was an eyewitness. Okay, since so you trust in eyewitnesses much, let's listen to one right now. The rich man. He's now an eyewitness. The four held with just a word to him. <clears throat> it was just a saying. It was just a joke. All my friends was going to be there. All the stories we hear. I'll have some buddies there. Oh, it's going to be great. It's not great. Let's listen to an eyewitness. He calls out. He sees... Abraham, and he sees Lazarus afar off, but he recognizes him. Now he's wanting this beggar to help him. You may go through heartaches, you may go through troubles, you may go through trials down here in this life. Don't worry about it. Don't let it love you. Do like Christ done when he's seen the cross before him. He looked on the other side. Look on the other side of the river. The last song that we sung that I wrote, I've been trying for years to get that last verse. When you cross, she'll it yours. I've been trying for years to get that in song, but I never went fix it for me. It'll be missing. When you cross, she'll be yours. Just look upon those waters. He's going to be there standing. Come on, Peter. Come. You know what I told Peter when he was in the boat? Lord, if it's you, bid me to come to you. Hey, what? You know what? We'll take right across the chilly Jordan. This. Okay. No problem. Just walk right on that water. Go to the Lord Jesus. But this eyewitness that is in hell now. He's looking out. He's seeing this old beggar being coming. He's seeing this beggar having a good time. He's seeing this beggar like he used to be. Bearing something. Everything's working great. He's in a peaceful place. No problems, no sores, no heartache, no worrying about tomorrow where he's going to have to uh, beg for something to, to eat, for something to drink. You know what? Now the beggar's got it made. But this eyewitness that's in hell, listen. He said, send that old beggar over here that he might just dip his finger in water. Dip it in my tongue. That will give me a little bit of comfort. Now it's kind of odd that he would ask that out the beggar, isn't it? God had to send some dollars to do that with the beggar. Now he's one of the beggars that come to him. This dip was funny in the water. He said, I am tormented in this flame. That tells me that there's flame there. That tells me that when you go there, you're going to be able to feel, you're going to be able to see, you're going to be able to think, you're going to be able to remember. God's a past life. Preaching a little country church over in Ohio one time. On Sunday morning. The only time I've ever preached where two people got saved. 
But I thought about it when they rung the bell over there. All the people in that community, if they don't make it to heaven and they end up in hell, they end up in the place of torment, they're going to hear every time that church bell comes. Because that was a reminder that none of God's house except Jesus Christ is the perfect place. So if you go to hell, you're going to be able to think, you're going to be able to see, you're going to be able to remember. He said, I've got five brothers back on earth. I know they're back there because I don't see them here. But he says, I know they're coming here. And I don't want them to. This man that didn't have compassion for no beggar before has now got compassion for his family. I wonder how much compassion he had for his family, you know, because when you're rich, you kind of have a tendency to look down on the poor. When you have wealth, and you have goods, and you have things, you have a tendency to look down on those people. You know what? They may have a thing, you may not. In the situation of this story. And he said one thing. If he can't come and dip his finger in water and dip it in my tongue, please, Father Abraham, send him back to my five brothers. Because he said, if one would raise from the dead, they would believe him. You know what Abraham said? They've got Christ. They've got Moses and the prophets. If they're not persuaded, that way. You know what? There's no words that I could ever dream of that would cause you to come to Christ or cause anyone else to come to Christ. The words has already been written down. Only thing I can do is be a messenger. Only thing I can do and you can do is tell someone else. And that's all you're required to do. You're not required to save anybody. You're only required to carry the message. You're only required to do the job. I have a lot of tools in my toolbox that won't do a thing until I get a hold of them. When God's a hold of you, and he, he might have to twist you a little bit every once in a while to get you to do the job. And when he gets a hold of you and twists you just a little bit, you'll get the job done. And be well to do it. When he does a little bit of twist and a little bit of encouragement. Them tools won't do nothing until I pick them up. So the master gets a hold of us. So the master gets a hold of us, our lives will come change. And I want to tell you, rich man, you said if Lazarus was raised from the dead, then your brother would believe. No. Because one has raised from the dead and, and thousands did not believe. One's been sent to us from the dead. And still, thousands. Take this message to someone, somewhere, whatever God tells you to remember. Be a blessing to someone. I can go out and count them one second, some of them in the face. I believe in giving them any faith, right? That ain't been too long, man. You got a few minutes for that, and they're getting it. I watched a little bit faster.